Opening scripture for the message today is going to be Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Maybe this highlighter will work. Feel it will work. Is Jeremiah J-E-R-I or J-E-R-A? E. E. J-E-R-E. Jeremiah. 29.10. This marker isn't very dark. We're going to fix this. I think the red one's pretty good. <laughs> Need to switch to PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> well, we could do that. If, I you know. know. I just. I don't know. I'm uncomfortable with the transition. <laughs> I'm old school. Anyways, Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you, and cause you to return to this place. And what's interesting about this, and I think what's uh, pertinent, also, you know, not including the message, but, you know, Babylon is actually what Brother Mark is going over as far as Philos is concerned. So maybe this will kind of pique your interest as to the spiritual implications of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Babylon the Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know, at this time period, the Israelite people were actually, uh, the Lord sold them into bondage to the Babylonians. You know? Right. And it was far enough away from their own country that they couldn't really escape. Right. Hmm. I think, Brother Mark, because I read the Philos a little bit, but I think he said that it was about a, a, probably a three-month journey back to where the Israelites were originally from. Right. Right? And, like, if it was an army, and they were packed light, and they were moving swiftly, it would only be about a month. But for, like, common travelers, it was, like, three months. Right. Okay. So, really, they were stuck there, and they couldn't get out of it. They needed someone to deliver them out of bondage. Mm -hmm. Again, because this isn't the first time. The first time would actually have been in Egypt. Now, this time... It's in bondage to the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, uh, bondage to Egypt represented bondage to sin. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to spoil anything for Mark, but yeah. you could, the implications probably carry over into what Babylon is considered to be spiritually as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, verse... 11, again, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Because the Israelite people were lack, they, they, they had no hope. True. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. Mm. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Okay? Which is interesting, because we know that the Lord does not hear the prayers of sinners, but here, you know, in verse 12, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You know? Yep. So, the Lord does not listen to the prayers of sinners. He knows that they're praying, but he does not honor the things that they request. Right. Because they do not have the Holy Spirit to intercede for them. Mm. That's the reason why. You know, and so this is also prophetic of the church. And that when you are adopted into the church, 
you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, so the prayers that you pray actually reach him. You know, through through the veil, straight into the presence. Yes. You know, we have Jesus as an anchor of the soul. Yes. Okay. Why bring that up? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at this. Let's look at this word peace, right? Here in uh, verse eleven, it says that the Lord, you know, he he has thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Let's look at this word peace, okay? This word in Hebrew, because this is the Old Testament, Jeremiah is in the Old Testament, is shalom, okay? Peace, but it's not like peace, love, and happiness. I haven't told you guys yet, but I got into a pretty interesting, well, it wasn't really a back and forth with an atheist yesterday. Cool. Who believes that, I mean, she absolutely hates uh, God in the Old Testament, and she sees Jesus in the New Testament as like a hippie. Oh, my. And it kind of mm -hmm. kind of blew me away, you know, and she's like, Jesus was all about, you know, like peace, love, and happiness, and all these kinds of things, and he seemed like a real chill guy. That guy in the Old Testament, man, I really did not like him. And, you know, I just kind of was, was patient with that and responded as best I could. But with unreasonable people, there is no reasoning. No, no there is isn't. True. No, you're right. <laughs> you're right. So anyways, this is certainly in Hebrew. It's number 7965, if you're interested in looking at Strong's. And the Hebrew word is spelled S-H-A... Uh, L O M, and it's shalom. I mean, even people say this today. Yeah. When they mean peace, they'll say like shalom, like especially in other kinds of cultures. And this means safe, well, happy, friendly, peace, which I'm not going to write again, and mm -hmm. prosper. Okay? I'm going to underline that one because that's significant to the topic today. <clears throat> Today's message is considering, you know, prosperity or prospering in Christ. What that looks like and how it differs from prospering in the world. Okay? Because this word here, peace, shalom, means to prosper. Yeah. Okay? So this is just one example that we're going to be pulling from, one resource that we have that is good. All right? So the next verse that we're going to look at is 1 Samuel, chapter 18, 1 through 6. First Samuel 18 covers uh, David. <coughs> David's soul. And this was before, right before Saul decided that he wanted to kill David out of envy. Because the Holy Spirit had departed from Saul and had, uh, you know, fallen upon David. Okay. They, were they were technically both God's anointed, though. Mm -hmm. Because Saul was anointed, Samuel anointed Paul, Paul right. Saul. And then Samuel also anointed David. And that's why David would not kill Saul, is because he was God's anointed. Right. And David had a very, very good knowledge about how the Lord repays any kind of wickedness right. towards those that are his own. You know, and that's largely the way that David went to war. Uh -huh. Is he would literally offer some kind of proposition, like he did with Nabal, where he was like, you know, I, I've been protecting you for such and such a time, I need you to uh, give my men some bread because they're hungry. And then, you know, it was the ball was in Nabal's court. And then, depending on how Nabal responded, uh, whether good or evil, good or wicked, um, if they responded well, then you know Nabal would have actually given bread and things to his troops, mm -hmm. things like that. But the, the the problem was that Nabal decided to forget about it. He said that he didn't even know who David was, and <clears throat> because Nabal ignored it. That was seen as wickedness. So David literally was going to go and kill Nabal after this. And that was 
an okay thing to do because Nabal dealt wickedly. So that's kind of the way that, you know, David remained righteous as a, like a warrior, you know, is because he would, he was reactive. Well, he was pre proactive and then reactive. Proactive means to, you know, make plans to avoid problems, and then reactive is to be presented with a problem and then react to it. So he would offer some kind of accord, and then if it was not responded to well, he had free, you know, reign to go and just like sack that city. Yeah. You know, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And largely that is the way that the Lord works because the Lord repays wickedness mm -hmm. with reward because reward can either be good or evil. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. Right. And typically, if it if someone does wickedly, the Lord will use another wicked people and have them destroy each other. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. First Samuel 18, 1 through 6. But that kind of covers like, um, in, only, I think the only reason that I went into detail with that is because this is where my daily reading has been lately, and I've just it's it's fresher uh, in my mind. First Samuel 18, 1 through 6. Okay, still talking about, you know, prospering. Okay, prosperity. What that looks like. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day, and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. You know, speaking about David. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, or they made an agreement, because um, Jonathan loved David as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. All right, so, uh, we're you know, looking closely, scrutinizing verse 5, where it says, behaved wisely. Implicitly, yeah, behaved. Okay, so we're going to look at the word behave. He behaved wisely, for the Lord caused him to behave wisely. Okay, so this word in Hebrew is seventy-nine nineteen, and it is sakal, S A K A L. It means to be circumspect and hence intelligent. To consider instruct and prosper. Would underline that, tie those two together. It also means to be prudent, which is to show caution, to have good success. So, you know, both of these words, uh, in each of their contexts, you could put the word prosper there and it would still be correct. Okay. So, as far as, so David went out and wherever Saul sent him uh, and behaved wisely, you know, he, he prospered. To behave wisely is to prosper. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's what prosperity is. That's what prosperity in Christ is. So it's not just like, monetary increase. It's a change in behavior is to prosper because that's what God sees. You know, God does not look at the outward man. He looks at the inward man. He looks at your behavior. He looks at your attitude. 
and your will and your desire to behave. Mm -hmm. Okay. Therefore, to behave wisely, uh, you know, to gain knowledge, or to, you know, as a good example, to read the Bible, to learn what the Bible says, see it as knowledge, because the Bible is knowledge, right? And then it becomes, you know, an aspect of what you do with said knowledge. So gain knowledge, and with this knowledge, know how to properly depart from evil, which is understanding. Understanding is to depart from evil. Okay? And understanding is shown. It's an act. It's a willful act. Mm -hmm. Using the knowledge, because you have to be directed. You have to be led. You know? Sure. And how to properly depart from evil. Evil being identified with the knowledge. Okay? Right. Or rather, you know, to do good. Because doing good is the same thing as departing from evil. Mm -hmm. You can't do both at the same time. Okay? When I was talking to the atheist lady yesterday, who so happens to be my my mom's sister. <laughs> my, Whoa. Her name is uh, Colleen. She was over at the house and she... I think she was like picking up something from my mom or something like that. But anyway, she did like this like really long personality test on me while I was trying to do my taxes. And it was kind of difficult for me to pay attention to both things at the same time. But it's very interesting to see like how you score on those kinds of tests based on your the renewing of your mind through Christ or in in Christ. You know. So I had really thought that it was going to change. And anyway, she had like finished the whole test, and I, she like identified me as this thing called an INFP, which is like a mediator type personality. She says that I'm very emotional, and I said yes, yes, I am. <laughs> and, and, uh, but anyways, <laughs> and, and then anyways, you know, I I had really, I was kind of talking to her about how I really see the world as you know a very very black and white kind of thing, and of course she's of the atheist mind says that there's just very, very many different shades of gray. You know, which to me is not correct. Right. And the reason for that is because order begets order. It's in its own lane. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got two lanes on the road. And then on the other lane you have chaos, and chaos begets chaos. Mm -hmm. Chaos does not come out of order, and order does not come out of chaos. They're in their own individual lanes. Amen. Okay? Yep. And you should never really try to mix those two. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's right. where you get a lot of problems. Yeah. So, That's true. understanding... So, because doing good is the same thing as departing from evil, departing from evil is understanding. I think it says that in either Ecclesiastes or Proverbs. Understanding is to depart from evil. And having done this, you prove that you have understanding. You know, because it's... You, you can't just believe, you also have to obey. You have to prove a point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And having done this, you prove that you have understanding. And what moves you to do this is a righteous fear of the Lord, which is wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is a fear of the Lord. And that's how you show that you have wisdom. Okay? And that's kind of wraps that all up and this encapsulates you know prospering in Christ embracing the future that he has prepared for you by walking in the steps that he is directing you mm -hmm. you know like oh go this way <laughs> all done <laughs> yep this right. back up for a sec let's go this way you know and <laughs> and uh a real good example of that is, is, is the footsteps of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, like he has already walked the steps that we're supposed to just follow and enter, emulate, compare ourselves to. So, this encaps encapsulates, you know, prospering in Christ, embracing the future that he has prepared for you. Um, pleasing, pleasing him is what we want to do. Okay, so the next verse that we're going to look at is Psalm 37. 
27, 23 through 27. of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, mm-hmm. for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. So, by behaving wisely, we are allowing the Lord to work for us, which is prospering, mm-hmm. is having our steps for him to walk in. Mm-hmm. Allow the Lord to order your steps. When you walk in his way, he, the Lord, is delighted in that your way is his way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 16 through 18. lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So, And the way that the Lord prospers us, we ever increase and are renewed spiritually. And yet, as the days go by physically, you know, we diminish. We get older, we get sick. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we even die before we're supposed to. Right. As we have all sinned, we are all appointed to die the first death. So, it's unavoidable. Right. Well, that's okay, because we have hope. And because we have hope, we have, as Brother Arthur put earlier today, joy. Hmm. Because we have hope. Mm-hmm. Very close to those two. All the while being sustained materially, as we have need of you know, food, water, clothing, shelter, family, but not to rigorous excess. Okay? The kingdom's riches, spiritually and monetarily, are meant to be distributed in such a way as to have every saint's need needs met in good faith. Yeah. The next verse that we're going to turn to is Luke chapter 12, verse 22.
12, 22. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to the stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have any anxious or nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches nor moth destroys, for where your heart is there, uh, for where your treasure is, there your heart also mm. will be. So you know it has become my my impression, especially lately, that excess not only corrupts but also spoils. You know what is the use of a thing if not for the Lord's purposes? Mm. You know. Is it wise to seek to be treated fairly uh, by the world when the world itself inherently is not fair? No. No. This is where you get a lot of those first world problems, which are similar to those third world problems, but they have their differences. So, you know, examples of third world countries would be Africa, Asia, Latin America, North Korea, Togo, Madagascar. Afghanistan, Haiti, those are different examples of third world countries. And you can, a country can be classified as a third world country through political agenda, like North Korea, or through just economic poverty, okay? So some examples of problems with third world countries are, you know, water and plumbing. You know, people are still carrying their water to their house. Yeah. Hunger by poverty, war in economy. So one in nine experience, you know, hunger and starvation, those types of things. Healthcare is an issue. War and education. Though I can't say that the United States education is all that great, yeah. these other places have, you know, little to none. Pretty much what maybe their parents could teach them, and that's it. Now, if you compare that to first world problems, you know, we get into things like identity politics, because all of these previous problems have more or less been taken care of. You know, the United States is one of the only countries where a war has not been fought on its own turf. You know, there was the Civil War, but that was amongst itself. You know, there has been no other nation that has invaded the United States. But in first world, we get to these problems where it's like, if there's not a problem, you have to make one up. Hmm. You know, So identity politics is a really problematic thing. It's very disparaging as far as identity politics is when people of a particular race, ethnicity, gender, or religion form alliances and organize politically to defend their own interests. So some examples of that would be like the feminist movement, which is what Brother Mark was talking about earlier as far as, you know, the roles and the values of men and women, how they have shifted. And another example would be, you know, which is an example of a good one, because I don't want to just give bad ones, but a good one would actually be the civil rights movement. 
Uh, other bad ones would be, you know, gay liberation and like the Me Too movement. Those kinds of things. So those are like first world problems, right? It can never be, and the thing is, is like, it can never be balanced because equality of opportunity does not necessarily mean equality of outcome. Because the world is not fair. You know, even though both men and women are allowed to pick the exact same jobs, it's still shown that women, on average, make less than men, not because they get paid less, but because they do not pick the same jobs that men do. They do not work the same amount of hours that men do. Right? So even though everyone is free and permitted to do whatever they want to do, quality of opportunity does not equal the quality of outcome. And a big reason for that is because the world is not fair. But God is fair. Amen. You know, one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to become a Christian is because I recognized that the world is not fair. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to play a game in a rigged system. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know? Yeah. God is fair. Okay? And as he has said, he will provide everything that you have need of. Albeit you do need to ask. You need to seek it. And as we know, it is according to his will. Right. Okay. Next verse that we're going to go to... Oh, another thing. Is... I, I did my taxes yesterday. And I literally... I, I've definitely been pursuing wealth too much. I worked a lot this past year. And I literally don't have anything to show for it. I did my taxes, and it turns out that all of my state income tax was not being taken out of my paychecks. So I, oh, <laughs> I, had, no. to pay, I had to pay like a bunch of money back. Yeah. And so I really didn't get like anywhere you know, in my own mind. I'm like, why did I even do this? I could have saved myself a lot of hardship. You know? And that's what you get. When the Lord, when the lily tries to you know toil and spin, that's what you get. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not so it's, it is what I deserve. Next verse that we're going to look at is First Timothy six six through eleven. with contentment is great gain. And you know, this is another definition of prosperity in Christ. This is prospering in Christ. Mm -hmm. That great gain from godliness and contentment, that is prospering. Okay. Mm -hmm. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we could carry nothing out. Mm -hmm. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into, into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Perdition means destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And so you can see that the love of money has caused people that were previously faithful Christians to depart. So it is a very present and dangerous kind of thing. And it, it creeps up on you because you'll start to desire something, you'll start to want something, and then you'll be like, oh, well, if I ask God and I pursue that, it'll, it'll, it'll happen. <laughs> right. Not so. <laughs> Not so. <laughs> Sometimes worrying may get, you know, the better of us. And we can save ourselves much heartache by practicing contentment with godliness. And as that example that I showed you just a little bit ago about me doing my taxes and finding out that, you know, I thought I was going to get like a big tax break. It didn't happen. I'm really no better of a person than I was before I had started working way too many hours. Right. You know, 
for whatever reason, decided to put myself back in the rat race and thinking that the world is fair. You know? <laughs> God was just keeping you from the love of money. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's fine. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it is uh, it is a, a bit of a wake-up call every time, you know? Yeah. Anyways, the next thing that we're going to look at is Titus 3.8. Titus 3.8. should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Mm -hmm. okay. Maintain good works. These things are profitable. Okay. Godliness is profitable. Not necessarily materially to access, but materially to Efficiency. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And spiritually spirals upward mm -hmm. to yeah. heaven. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next verse we're gonna look at is Psalm 37, 1 through 24. Kind of circling back around, wrapping things up. Circling back around to Psalm 37. And this time we're gonna look at 1 through 22, I think. Psalm 1 through 22. And you know, this is the uh, the previous few chapter uh, verses of what we had gone over previously about here. We're circling back around because it helps to prove a point. Uh, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass. Okay. And you know, soon to us seems like a long time, when to the Lord it does not seem like very long at all. Um, you know, our lives really are, you know, the blink of an eye, um, vapid, as far as how quickly they do disperse in light of God's eternity. Mm -hmm. you know? So it is soon to him, and I've heard from many people that as you get older, life goes faster and faster. So, For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Verse 3, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. Okay? For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. You know? Now the earth, this is... I think this is speaking about the new earth and the new heaven. The new covenant. Okay? For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place but it shall be no more, but the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just, and gnashes at him with his teeth, 
the Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. And to smoke they shall vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. Mm. So certainly seeking prosperity in the Lord is great gain. Contentment with godliness <coughs> is great gain. Behaving wisely, being obedient, is great gain. Not <coughs> monetarily to excess, but to sufficiency, dwelling in contentment with what he has provided for you to just, you know, live fairly comfortably, you know. Mm -hmm. Do not fret because of evildoers, and you are only envious of the workers of iniquity. Like, do not look at the things that they possess and seem, and have it seem as something to be desired. Do not want them, for these are all things that fade with the passing of time. You know, world, worldly possessions will not redeem anyone. You know. Alright, next verse we're going to look at is Psalm 16, 4 through 6. Psalm 16, 4 through 6. Their uh, sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another god. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance in my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, this word... Five, it says, you are my portion of my inheritance in my cup. Now let's look at this word portion really quick. You, as David says here, you know, you are my, you are the portion of my inheritance in my cup. I'm going to write this over here because I don't want to bend over. Um, a portion. This word in Hebrew is number four, four, nine, zero. And it's uh, uh, manna, but it's not uh, like the bread. And I don't think they're related either. But this word, portion, or uh, manna, is something weighed out. Something weighed out specifically a ration of food. So I guess in kind of a loose sense it is related to manna, or you know, the bread of heaven in the Old Testament. Because we know that Jesus is the bread of heaven. But uh, this here just means portion. You know, something weighed out. You know, something interesting about manna was they were only supposed to take so much in and they weren't supposed to try and like keep any of it. You know, or else they would uh, get maggots and stuff in it. And then uh, the Lord would get angry with them for keeping it because they were supposed to leave it you know, outside. They were only supposed to take uh, enough for just themselves. You know. Let's 
Well, sorry. So I can. <laughs> a ration of food, right? So if we want more, like if we want more than just what the Lord has desired, has, has like purposed in his heart to give us, then you know, you and I are in the wrong. We should be content with this, with what he provides, you know. And then when we get to the, the area where that, that we decide that we want more than what he has portioned to us, that's when we get into that area of, of, of worrying and fretting. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. We have one more verse to go. Thank you for being patient with me thus far. We're going to turn to Psalm 17, 15. Psalm 17, 15. And this is literally just the, what, what we're enduring for. You know, what we are being content for, what we are prospering for, what we are behaving wisely for. Psalm, um, I, I just said it. 15. 17, 15. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. You know, that's, that's, that's what we're waiting for. Because, you know, be content in godliness to death. Um, and then you know you'll, you'll get to rest for a little while, and then one day, on the day of judgment, you will awake, you know, and it will be the day of jubilee, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this uh, concludes today's message. Once again, thank you for being patient with me. Thank you for.